Might I begin with a question that's formed in the very beginning of your praise and prayer sheet? Take it out. You already got it. You can give it one. And you'll see in the very beginning, God, God's calling on my life is blank. During the course of the next half hour, I want you to write in something. And then we're going to collect them and grade them. No, that's not what we're going to do, okay? I just, just, just let you know that, okay? But I want to ask you the question. I'm asking you the question, when did God call you? When did he commission you? I say that for those of you that are military sorts, understand the nature of commissions. What is God's claim on your life? Uh, let me suggest that there's two kinds of calling. There's primary callings that are global in nature. Uh, let me give you an example. God has called me to love my wife as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for it. So I can roll out of bed in the morning and say, dear woman, you're going to be the death of me. That's why I can say that, you say. In fact, if you're married, you can say that to your wife right now. Yeah, dear woman, you're good. Yeah, no, you know how this works, you see. God's calling globally on me is to love my kids, my children. And that doesn't stop when they leave the home. I need to, because you see, family is more important than ministry. Family is more important than your job. I can say, God's calling on my life is to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ to a needy world because he's called me to this church and the vision statement of this church becomes my vision statement. It's part of what it means to participate, to belong to this place. But there are secondary callings that are more situation specific. They're short term. For example, God's called me to a teaching pastoral ministry, Ground Bible Chapel, but that ministry's in transition this year. And as you've noted, Frank Vitale's taking my place gradually. It's a good thing. And Gary Campbell's taking Frank's place in terms of the administration stuff. That's a good thing. More about that in a bit. Situation specific, God has called me to care for the members of my small group. Over the years, Joanne and I have been part of a number of small groups. And when you join a small group, the unstated and sometimes stated covenant is the fact that that becomes the surrogate spiritual family. It doesn't take priority over your physical family and spiritual family that way, but those people become my people. When they ask for prayer, I pray. Friends, you're part of a small group. Because we all need people to whom we care and who cares for us. Most of us have a hard time with the idea of call. We think that God's call only comes to those who are special or gifted, especially those in various types of Christian work, missionary sorts. But I want to suggest today that Gideon's story blows that theory completely out of the water. Because if God could call Gideon, then he's got a claim on everyone here. <laughs> we'll see why. If God would choose to call a guy like Gideon, all of us are in the loop for his call. Hence, while I bore you to tears, you can start writing down what God's claim on your life is. Gideon's story and his call helps us understand what God's intention is. We're going to read Judges 6 this morning, and we're going to read it in sections. So I want to tell you that I'll give you the main idea ahead of time before we start reading the text. And that is that the call of God comes within a specific context, verses 1 to 10. And then it has a kind of command, initial command, that basically challenges who we see ourselves to be and how we deal with the people around us. And finally, sometimes it comes with a confirmation, a way to encourage us before it seems to be enacted. First of all, the context of Gideon's call. Would you follow along? I'm reading Judges 6, verses 1 to 10. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. 
They came up with their livestock in their tents like swarm of lo swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Note what happens, verse 7. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt, from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. It's not a pretty picture. So this context establishes, first of all, a cause, why life's this way. Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They failed to obey his instructions. They worshiped other gods. They followed other sorts of people. And ultimately, Israel failed to listen. They refused to listen, even when God came to them again and again and again. Well, I'm trying to get your attention. They said, ah, I got better things to do. God's calling, I suggest, always comes in the context of unbelief. Can I say that one more time? God's claim on your life always comes in a context of unbelief. Not just globally in terms of the nations around, but sometimes within the very people of God. So you dare not say, God called me, but I, you know, I'm going to do what everyone else said, or everyone else is doing. God calls Gideon amidst the situation where not only the pagan lands, but even the supposedly God-fearing people don't have a clue and don't listen to God. The text says that Israel did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And I want to suggest, as I was reading this a bunch of weeks ago, I said, oh my goodness gracious, this is scarily analogous to our day and age. Not only is our culture increasingly pagan, but even people who profess to know the name of Jesus often do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Because even we as Christians have substituted pleasure for principle, comfort for commitment. We take up our couch nightly instead of our cross daily. We sing about the good news, but barely speak about it in our private conversation. Can I just give you a kind of thing here? We've had a great time with singing this morning. Great. Some of the words are so poignant to me, I just can't say them. You know, the words, just the, the emotions are tough. But I want to ask myself and ask you the question, will we talk about it when we leave the room? <laughs> we show up at times of worship, but are barely visible as Christ's followers in the nitty-gritty of daily life. We do evil by doing nothing at all. As now, so then, the hidden cause results in a very public crisis. The crisis has shown that God allows his people's enemies to get their attention. The Midianites invade, they have a power of number, they're a nomadic group, and they impoverish the Israelites. And you understand what's going on sociopolitically and even uh, economically here. An agrarian country, the Israelites, have been given this land, they've been given a land to farm. And the result is they're overrun by these Midianites and Amalekites who come from other places, and they come and they swoop down and take everything out of, the, out of their storehouses. And what's at stake underneath it is that the lack of commitment to God basically fragments their response to their enemies. Understand sociologically what's happening. Because God's people fail to worship him, they are fractured as a people. And the result is that when enemies are on the horizon, they don't go to each other because there's nothing that holds them together. So that the worship of the Lord God is not just a spiritual thing, but it has a sociological dynamic that allows people to protect each other. But we're too interested in ourselves. Or they were 1,300 years before Jesus came. The result, the cause, the lack of unifying worship results in a crisis. The loss of food, wealth, even a future. And then the text gives this an amazing clarification, verses 7 to 10, and it says, 
But God's people cried, and it seemed like God didn't listen. Why? I suspect they cry only out of self-interest. And God says, I'm not going to listen because you haven't listened. And because you haven't listened, we don't have a relationship that's authentic. A couple weeks ago, we had a town hall meetings here. And at the end of that, I pled with you all that you would pray for us as a body and for us as a leadership, that God would grant us vision, wisdom, and love. Some of you here remember that. Have you been praying that? I trust yes, but I'm going to say this is a house of prayer, friends. So if you want, I feel compelled to say, Lord, would you hear us again? I want to pray on behalf of us all right now, in the next two minutes, okay? That we ask God, because I want us to be a listening community. If we're not, then we're fractured. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, far be it from me to preach and not practice. Far be it from us to be folk who come with comfort and no commitment. So on behalf of my brothers and sisters here, I plead with you. Would you give us vision for the next step of the journey? Would you give us wisdom how to implement that vision? And through it all, would you give us love to care for each other so the evil one would not fracture us as a people, a church, and a movement of yourself? We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people should say, Amen. So, the context is stated. The stage is set. What will God do? Well, here's the amazing thing. He does something that's totally unexpected. Follow along, verse 11 of, chapter, of Judges chapter 6. 11 says, the angel of the Lord, we all know that this is a code word for Jesus, come, pre-incarnate kind of appearance, came down and sat under the oak at Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abyssalite. And his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. A little time out. Gideon's hiding. Wine presses are these holes in the ground that you crush the grapes so that the juice can be gathered. Gideon's so afraid of his enemies, he's crushing wheat there instead of up on the hill so when they crush the wheat, the husk can get blown away. He didn't want anybody to see him. He's hiding. Friends, are you hiding today? Something in your past, even in your present, even something in your future. It doesn't want to make you take a stand. Follow on. Verse 13. But, sir, Gideon replied. He's one full of faith here. Has the temerity to say, God, you don't have a clue. But, sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? We're all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Gideon asked, But Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in my family. The Lord said, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Comment. Duh. None of you see yourself in this comment, correct? Oh, I see myself in this comment. And you understand that Gideon has got two questions. His first question is, who are you, Lord? That's quickly followed by, who am I, Lord? So Gideon proposes a test. Let's read on, verse 17. Gideon replied, but if I have now, if I found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. He doesn't even trust his own eyes. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait till you return. 
Gideon prepared a young goat and from an ephah of flour. He made bread without yeast, putting meat in the basket, broth in a pot, and brought them out and offered them under the, the oak. You understand the picture here? You know what's going on? He's got this stuff for the oak. He puts it on a rock. The Lord said next to the rock. He pours over the broth, over everything. This is kind of like Elijah and Baal. You make sure that this is not accidental stuff's going to happen next. Oh, you know what takes place next, okay? Verse uh, 20, the angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat, the unleavened bread, place it on this rock, pour out the broth, and Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the face, was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The angel appears visibly, but still speaks audibly. Verse 23, the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid, you're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord, and there called it, the Lord is peace. To this day it stands at Ophrah, the Abyssalites. And I want to suggest that the Lord welcomes the test because it reestablishes Gideon's relationship with him. You know, we periodically need to connect again with God. And God is calling not just it, Gideon, to do amazing things for his people, he's calling him to be one of a fervent follower, from a doubter to a devoted one. But God's calling not only changes the relationship with Gideon, it changes Gideon's relationship with his people. Read on, verse 25. That same night, the Lord said to him, take a second bowl from your father's herd, the one seven years old. I think there's some linkage there between how long they've been in bondage and what's going on with the bull, okay? The other thing that's going on, bulls were sacred animals to the bales and the asterisks. So he's basically killing the very thing that seemed to be important to the pagan religion. He says, tear down your father's altar to Baal, cut down the Asherah pole beside it, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Much more could be said here, but the, the altars that God wants were of undressed stone. And by breaking it down, he's making the altar of dressed stone for the Baals, something that's suitable for an offering to the Lord God. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the men in the town, he did it at night rather than in the what? Friends, I like this guy. I mean, I'll tell you, this is my kind of guy, okay? I don't know about you, but this is my kind of guy, okay? And if you think you got family issues, Gideon did too. Amen and amen. In the morning, when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished. With the Asherah pole beside it cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar, and they asked, who did this? They carefully investigated, and they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. And the men of the town demanded Joash, bring out your son. You almost get the picture. Gideon's hiding behind his dad. He must die because he's broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around, are you going to plead Baal's case? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal is really God, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So that day they called Gideon Jerob Baal, saying, let Baal contend with him because he broke down Baal's altar. Three huge points about this calling. First of all, we said the context is that of disbelief or unbelief. But note what the calling does. It first of all changes Gideon's relationship to God. That happens when he has the temerity to give an offering of worship. Friends, it's what we do when we come to communion. We say, Jesus died in my place. I'm giving you back the praise you deserve. That point of communion happens in this room on the first Sundays of the month, other times, other places. The elders have encouraged small groups to practice communion in their small group meetings. We've done it in our family gatherings because there's something amazing that happens when we change our identity before God by we say, Jesus, you took my place. I want to remember that. But the second change that takes place is not just his relationship between him and God, but it's also between his relationship to him and his people. You 
probably noted this. When God calls Gideon, he says, kind of greetings to you, oh mighty warrior. You remember that? Most of you chuckled inside, didn't you? I mean, you did, right? Because this guy's a guy that's got doubts, and he doesn't have a clue what to be. He says, God, not me. And most of us are saying, God, you're really blind. You don't see what's right before your very eyes. This guy, Gideon, doesn't have the right stuff. You haven't thought that. Yes, you did. Shake your head. I mean, you, you thought that, right? And that's precisely the point, because God doesn't see Gideon as he is, but as he will be. And friends, the huge question becomes this. Will I see myself the way God wants to see me? The way he's going to see me? C.S. Lewis makes it the point in Narnia. When the king and queen of Narnia become the charwoman and the, uh, the, the horse cabbie. He says, if we could see now what people will look like then, we would fall down and worship them. <laughs> Because God sees us as princesses and princes of a kingdom that will last forever. And the identity change comes because Gideon has the temerity to believe in his God. Then it changes his identity with God's people. He's the one who has the temerity to break down, even in his despair, even in his doubt, the very idol to Baal and Ash, the Asherah pole. And he does it at night, but Lord bless him, at least he does it. And the result is a quest is made to show God's people that the real power comes with God, not with idols. And the third thing that the call of Gideon does is it changes this instrumentality regarding God's enemies. And I choose this word with a slight pun intended because what Gideon does is he picks up a horn, an instrument, and blows it as a way to summon and bring God's people together. And I'm suggesting that God wants to do the same thing with each of us. He wants to change our view of ourselves to see it as God sees us. He wants to change our involvement with each other within the believing community. And he ultimately wants to change our usefulness to the world out, outside. I like, for example, the classic prayer by Francis of Assisi. And I, I, I want us to say it out loud at this point, if it's possible. Because what Assisi did was he made use of this idea of instrumentality. Would you say it with me together? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much speak as consoled, as to console, to be understood, as to understand, to be loved, as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. And all God's people will say. So Gideon blows the horn. The people rally. You can get the thing happen. It's a great deal, okay? And all of a sudden, Gideon starts shaking in his sandals again. I would too. And one thing to have this private little worship event with the Lord, okay? Well, that's pretty interesting stuff. Another thing to kind of do it at night, some stuff. You tear down the altar and you kind of get a pass from your friends, okay? But now all of a sudden, the enemies of God are on the horizon. Follow along where we read, verse 33. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. 
Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abyssalites to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, also to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet him. And Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there's any dew on the fleece and the grounds, all the grounds dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that's what happened. Gideon rose early the next day, squeezed out the fleece, and wrung out dew, a bowl full of water. You think that might be enough, right? You, you, you think it might be enough, right? Mm. Then Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me. <laughs> I've had kids like that. You know how this works, yeah. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one last time to test with the fleece. This time make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry and the ground was covered with dew. Friends, you'll understand what's going on in the text here. Gideon's the first judge in the narrative of the judge's narrative that the emphasis is not so much on what goes on between the judge and the enemies. It's not so much involved with external conflict. But what Gideon betrays is how God deals with internal conflict. And the real battle, the real story of Gideon is how God is going to deal with people who don't instinctively internalize their faith with God. The people who have got doubts up the wazoo about whether God is big enough to follow. Uh, people like me and like you. And so the call comes in the context of not just Israel's distress, but their doubt as a believing people. Because what the, what the story of Gideon wants us to hear and see is that one plus God is a majority. Amen. If all you've got is God, that's all you need. And yet God submits to Gideon's test. Why? Because I think God wants to show Gideon three things about who he is that will sustain him in the work to come. First of all, it's a sign of God's power. God is the power person. He's the one. He's the power broker over all creation. He's the one that can make dew fall and not fall on particular places. The second thing this shows is that the God is the God of promises. Dew is a picture throughout the Old Testament as a sign of God's blessing. Moses prays in Genesis 32 that his teaching would fall like rain and his words would descend like do, that God wants to come upon us the refreshment that comes that way. The blessings of God's people are like the dew of Hermon, Psalm 133. Isaiah 26, 26 19 likens the resurrection of God's people from the death, dead as a dew, like the dew of the morning where the earth will give birth to her dead. In other words, the great power of God is geared up in his promises to be dew-like upon us. You understand the logic. He's not only our creator, but he's our covenant maker. He's not only the power broker, he's the promise keeper. And God wants Gideon to know he can go into battle because he's got God on his side. But the third is even more exciting. It's a sign of God's presence. In Hosea 14, God says to his people, I will be as the dew unto Israel. This dew that would come heal and refresh, God promises to come near and to bring sustenance to the soul dryness of his people. Understand that God's call comes in a context of unbelief, not just in the people around, but sometimes even within the people of God. Then God's call comes with a command. Come near to him. Bring yourself as a living sacrifice, Paul would say in Romans 12. Bring your worship to him alone. And as a result, he's going to change the way you see him and you see yourself. And finally, God's coming, his calling, comes with encouragements. I'm not going to share all the ways in which God's encouraged me over the years, but they come deliberately because God knows he calls people who are weak and frail, and fragile. Folk like Gideon. And the real question is, will we hear 
his call and claim on our life? And will we by faith seek to put it into practice? Friends, have you filled out your line yet? Will you fill it out this week? I, for one, would be delighted to pray with you over what you write down. And while you're doing it, will you ask God to give you the power and the promise and his presence to live it out among us and this community? And then we become sons and daughters of this doubtful Gideon guy who next week does great things. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I want to say thank you for calling us, for calling me, calling each of us, calling us to believe even when we're filled with doubt, calling us to trust even when the prospects terrorize us. Would you, Lord, help us to see ourselves the way you do? And leave this room encouraged to follow you in the next week before us. Lord, I don't know how this all applies to the people who are here and those even that are watching online. Would you do your work in ways I can't even imagine? And make us people who are bold for your kingdom's sake. We'll pray these things in the name of Jesus. And God's people will say,